Okay, so today our class is about the story of Ruth, and today is part one. What I would like to start with, why are we reading now the story of Ruth? I didn't just choose it just because it's nice to learn about our special women, great women that we had, which is important. And those of you who are coming to the class for a while, you know that I always like to put emphasis whenever we can, when we learn, and we have obviously great men, we have obviously women, we have to learn about the women. And there's a lot that we can understand and feel and so on and so forth, right? Because all of us are women. Obviously, the Torah was given to women and men equally. Some things we are more responsible for, something the men are more responsible for, but obviously we learn it all. So the reason we decided now to learn the story of Ruth, because many didn't have the custom that on Shavuot, we read Megillat Ruth. We read the story of Ruth. Why? Some of the reasons are, one is the great-great-grandson of Ruth who converted to Judaism was David HaMelech, King David. And King David lived only 70 years. He was born and he passed away on Shavuot. So it's a spell that's the yorset of David HaMelech of King David is Shavuot. So we read the story of Ruth, you know, since she was a great-grandma. Another reason also is, there's many, another one that I'll dwell on is that when we read the story of Ruth, as we all know, Ruth was not born to a Jewish family, not father, not mother, none of them were Jewish. Actually, she came from a nation that was very cruel and very rude. And here she is, she became the grandma of Mashiach. She became the Safta, the grandma of Mashiach, because... David Amelech was born from her, and then, as we know, Moshiach ben David from the tribe of Yehuda. How did she merit it? And it shows her devotion to Torah, her devotion to mitzvot, how much she loved the Torah. She left everything behind just to be, to learn Torah, to do whatever she can to become Jewish, even though she wasn't sure she'll be able to become Jewish, but she wanted to be with the Jewish people, with the Torah life. And because on Shavuot, we got the Torah. This is such a special, special yonta. Hello, Dorit. Um, we read the story of Ruth to learn from her how amazing she was and how much she sacrificed just to be with the Jewish people, just to be able to keep Torah and mitzvot and look the reward that she got, to be able to be the ancestor, basically, of Mashiach. The story of Ruth goes back to many, many years. It was after the time of Joshua, after the time of Yeshua, when the Eden were in Israel, till the first king, till Shaul Amelech, King Saul, then was King David, right? There was a period of about four decades, about 390 year, years, 390 years, that was called the time of judges, Shfota Shoftim, the time of judges. We didn't have a king. And the people who were ruling were every time was another judge, but it wasn't a very good time. And some judges were good and some not. And people were judging. It says, Shfota Shoftin. The people were judging the judges, not listening to them. And the way the Torah says, those of us who understand Hebrew, Kol Hayashar Be'enav Yase. Everybody used to do whatever is good in their eyes, they used to do which means there was a lot of corruption because everybody decided what is there. They used to judge and they judged <clears throat> the world and what they wanted to do according to them. And many times, obviously, it was not the right judgment. So here comes the time of Ruth. What happened, what the Torah says? Um, the Torah tells us that Shmuel Anovi, Samuel the prophet, Shmuel, as we know that his mother was Hannah, Hannah the prophetess, and as we know, we read it on Rosh Hashanah, she was barren, she couldn't have children, she cried and prayed and cried and prayed for so long, and she merited to have this amazing son, Shmuel, and he was... And we have somebody here also that has amazing son Shmuel, <laughs> Eugenia. And I have a grandson Shmuel. Anyway, all of us have Baruch Hashem, wonderful children. He was a very great holy man. And he was the one that wrote that story. So what is the Torah telling us? I would like to 
Luke can, you know, share with you a little bit from the inside as well, obviously commentaries, but the way the story goes, that it was during the time of the judges, Shvota Shoftim, and there was famine in the land of Israel. There was no food. Food did not grow, and it was hard, and many, many people, obviously, there's famine, God forbid. So who is the first one that doesn't have food? The people who have less money, because the food becomes very, very expensive. So the rich people can afford, and they can pay a lot of money for the food, but the middle class and the lower class, the money goes out, and they had no food. And there was a man by the name of Elimelech that lived in Yehuda in Bethlehem, and he decided he took his wife, Naomi, and two of his sons, Machlon and Kilion, and they decided to leave Israel and go to Eretz Moab, Moab, Moabite land, to Moab. Moab is where Jordan is today, to that part of Israel. They basically left Israel, crossed, and they decided to go there. It was very sad, and it was considered, obviously, as a sin in the, in, in the eyes of Hashem. Why? Why can't he, what, did he have to live in Israel? He wanted to leave Israel. Obviously it was wrong. Elimelech was of high stature. Elimelech was a leader. Elimelech was a great sage. And he was also an affluent man. He was, they were very, they were from the tribe of Yehuda. They were a um, important family, learned family, very wealthy family. And because there was a famine, everybody would come to their home, to their house, to ask for help. And Elimelech couldn't stand it. It was too hard for him that he had to help people all the time, all the time, all the time. He couldn't have his personal life, if I may. And it was hard for him, and he decided to leave. And to what country, to what land did he go? To Moab. What was wrong with Moab girls? What was wrong? When we go back in the Torah, when the Eden were in Egypt, and they left Egypt, they were in the desert, and they wanted to go into Israel. They had to pass the land of Moab. They had to pass where Jordan was, right? That's how they were coming. Mm -hmm. And Moab was very rude to the Jews. The Torah says, Lo kidmu etchem belechem ubemaim. When the Jewish people were going, they were tired. They were thirsty. They were hungry. They were coming from the desert to, to go into the land of Israel. If you are nice people, there are thousands, millions of people. There are old people there. There are women, children. Not everybody is strong and husky. And they didn't even give them not bread and not water, nothing. They were very, very stingy and they were very rude. And Hashem was very upset. And here, what is happening? Elimelech is going to a land that is not giving. And unfortunately, what did he do? He left his people in a very difficult time. And that was considered not the right thing because I know you want to have your private life, but when you are a wealthy person and you're a leader, you have to think, why did Hashem give me all that wisdom? Why did Hashem bless me with all that money, with all that power, with all that might? It's not for me to have a good life only. Obviously, it's nice that I have it, but I have to share, especially in time of despair, especially in time when everybody needs my help and I'm getting up and taking everything and leaving. And that was very sad. And when they got to that land, a short time after that, unfortunately, Elimelech died. And Naomi stayed alone. And it's very sad. It says that Naomi stayed alone and the Torah is writing that when a man dies, he dies and Ishmet Ella Leishto, he dies to his wife, which means who suffers the most? Obviously, the children are sad. God forbid if the father dies. But after all, who stays alone that has to deal with it day in, day out is the wife. So it says that Naomi was very broken. She stayed alone. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I was gonna say. I'm giving feminine conversation now. Okay, that's okay. I forgot to mention one thing. When they came to the land of Moab, remember we mentioned that two boys, Machlon and Kilion, they were grown up men and they had nobody to marry. There were no Jewish girls there. So they married two Moabite women. 
And we know that in the Torah, there was, there is a, a prohibition that says, Lo yavo amoni umoavi bikal Hashem. Even as many generations as they can be, somebody from the land of Ammon and the land of Moab, because they were so rude to the Jewish people, they cannot convert to, to, to the Judaism. They married two Moabite women. Those two girls were princesses. They were from the descendants of Eglon, Melech Moab. Eglon, the king of Moab, was done many bad things to the Jewish people. They were a stature, they were wealthy, they were nice, I mean, people as they were. And that's why the king agreed that they marry those two boys because, as we said, Elamelech was a very wealthy man. He was a very learned man. He was from a very important family from Yehuda in the Jewish people themselves as well and so on. And they got married. And after they got married a short time later, Elimelech dies and she stays herself with her two boys and the two daughter-in-laws. And then a short time after, I don't think it mentions how many years, unfortunately, the two boys die as well. Machlon and Kilion die as well. And slowly the... I guess there wasn't the man to work, so on and so forth. They became very, very poor. And Omi thought to herself, what happened to her? Her name was a very beautiful name, Naomi, right? Those of us who know Hebrew, Naim, pleasant, beautiful, sweet. Naomi is a very nice name. And she said, look, what happened to her? She stayed alone and she decided that it's time to go back to her land. She's in a strange land. Unfortunately, she lost her husband. She lost both of her sons. It's terrible. Such a tragedy S striked her to lose all of them. And she said, okay, she's got to go back. So she called both of her daughter-in-laws, Orpa and Ruth. And she told them, you know, I think that I have to go back. I'm an old woman now. I came here with lots of wealth, with, a lot of, with lots of fame. I had a wonderful husband. I had wonderful boys. And unfortunately, Hashem had made my life very bitter. I'm not Naomi. Don't call me Naomi. And I'm going to go back. But you are young. You should go back to your parents' home. You can get married. You can have families. You have a future. I have no future here. I'm going to go back. And now the Torah describes, the Migilat root describes how Shmuel and Novi wrote it. It's very, very touchy. And it's very, very emotional. How the two girls are standing there and they want to go with her. And it's interesting, girls, you know, how the Torah, everything the Torah writes, everything has a reason. Mm -hmm. And when we look in the Megillah, Megillah, Ruth, and story of Ruth, the Torah writes three times, the Megillah writes that Naomi told them, I'm older, I cannot have children anymore. Please go back to your parents' house. Then she tells them, you know, you were so kind to me. You stayed with me. You made, you had so much chesed, so much kindness to me. You didn't leave me alone. But now it's time that I go back and you stay. Please go back. And they said, no, we want to go with you. And then she told them, I'm older already. Do you think I can have more children? Even if I'm going to get married, I cannot have any more children that can marry you? Like, why do you want to stick to me? There is nothing that I can give you anymore. You have nothing for me. Please go back. She kept on repeating and she said it three times. And from here we'll learn there are many, many halachas, many laws we learn from the Megillah Ruth, how we conduct ourselves when somebody wants to convert to Judaism. Because as we know, later on in the game, we're going to learn in other classes, how come 
Ruth converted? Was she allowed? Because the Torah said that Lo yavo amoni umoavi bikal Hashem. So how, what happened there? So she told him three times because when somebody comes to convert, we have to try. Hello, Jennifer. I'm glad you're joining us now. Thank you. It's nice, you know, when people are have other stuff and they come right away when they finish. And she told them three times because when somebody's coming to convert, we try to talk them out of it because we want to see if they really mean it. So at least three times we have to tell them difficult things, this, this, this. And then if they still stick and they still want, then we know they really mean it. They're not doing it for any alternative motive, but just for themselves. And then the Torah is telling us what have happened. The girls started crying. And they said, we cannot leave you, Naomi. We love you. They really love their mother-in-law. And they really didn't want to leave. And then it says, they stood there and Naomi was trying to talk them into going and they were crying. And then it says that Orpa kissed Naomi and she left with all the tears that she cried. And Ruth cleaved to Naomi. Orpa kissed her and it says Ruth Davkaba, she cleaved, cleaved to her. She wanted to be with her. She glued to her. And it's very interesting here how the Maharal, you know, in a little bit more sophisticated, more in the hidden part of the Torah, try to explain what does it mean? Orpah and Ruth lived in a home that it was a lot of Jewish life. Elimelech was a sage. She was a great person. Unfortunately, it was a mistake what, what happened. And Naomi and her sons, they lived in Jewish life. They knew Torah. They learned a lot. They weren't just women just you know just like that they were great women and they knew so much and they knew what Torah meant and it was hard for both of them to leave but Orpa decided she says I know what it is I know how good it feels on the Shabbos table and when Yontav is and what Torah is and the mitzvot and how you can get higher and so on and so forth the spirituality in it but she didn't like the boundaries she didn't like that this you can do, this you can't. She she wasn't, she kissed, but she didn't get united. You know, you get a little close, but not close enough. And she decided that it's not her way of life. And she left. But Ruth stayed. And I want to share with you something else from the measures that's a little bit difficult to swallow. Um, but what happened is, and just on a higher level, so we understand a little bit more, it says that Orpa, she wanted to leave everything. She lived in a such high level with a lot of spirituality, and now she decided she's leaving it. So it says that the night that she left, the first night that she left, she was intimate, and it sounds really, really inappropriate with a hundred men that she was like crushed. She went so, so low. Here she was a princess in her parents' house. She was married to a very high such a man. She had such amazing in-laws and she knew that it was wrong, but in order to leave, she had to leave everything. She needed to go really, really low. Otherwise her conscience would bother her. So she decided to go really, really low. And we don't have time to discuss later with children she had, but one of her children was, and I do have to tell you, was Goliath, Goliath. Goliath was the Plishti, the Palestinian, the, the Philistinian, whatever, that lived there in Israel, that cursed the Jewish people, that he was a, he was a giant. He was not a good man. And who won him? David, King David, when he was a child, he was a young man. So here, the great grandson of Ruth, there were two sister-in-laws, in the end, one, the great grandson of Orpa. Orpa left Judaism. She went really, really low. And the story is told about a, a man, I forgot his name, that left Judaism. He converted. Didn't want to do anything. Didn't want to do anything with Torah. Laughed at everything. And one time he came to, uh, to a great sage, to a Jewish tribe, and he told him, you know, 
I'm doing everything wrong. I'm desecrating everything. I don't want to do anything with Torah, but my conscience doesn't let me. I still can't enjoy it because I know like something is bothering me. Something like I, I can't take out because I have this guilt in me all the time. So the rabbi told him, he said, you know, if you want to take out the guilt from you, because you see, that's what Orpah did. Orpah went all the way down from being a princess and being married to a man. It's true, she was now a widow. But to go live in one night with so many men, to bring yourself so down to such a, it's terrible. And that's how she went like, all the way down because she was so high. And she said, I want to forget it all. So she had to go all the way down. And then she had no conscience anymore, which is terrible. She was able to do terrible things without feeling bad. And this Jewish man, said it to the rabbi, but I still have guilt. So the rabbi told me, you know what? He says, how can I take it out? So the rabbi told me, you know what you can do? You know, in the morning girls, right? We have to wash Negelvas, we wash our hands. And the custom that Chassidim have, if you are careful, we put a basin, and I'm sure some of you know, we put a Negelvas, it's called, we put a basin next to our bed with a cup of water, with a cephalo, you know, water, how we wash our hands, or you can just put a plastic cup and we wash our hands six times right away when we get out of bed. Why? Because when we sleep, there is some impurity that we collect because we are like, we are not dead, God forbid, but there's some impurity because when we sleep, we can't walk, we can't talk, right? I mean, sometimes we do it sleepwalk, but we are not as a, as a Lord. And that's why there is some impurity and impurity and purity we can't touch. It's something spiritual can you touch the phone i could but can i touch the waves of the phone if somebody is is illiterate or somebody is primitive that will come or even if we thought about it our grand grandparents will come out you know from 100 years ago they will see the phone they wouldn't understand how does it work but we know that there is some waves in the air that we don't see but they exist right so so there's some impurity that we have that we don't see and we know it exists. And, and the Torah told us in order to take it off, you wash the hands six times and then it comes out from your whole body and we are pure again. So the rabbi told him that water has a lot of impurity. Like usually when we wash, right away we spill it out. He said, drink it and then you're going to be, you won't have guilt. You're going to be really low. Nobody drinks water of Negevasa. It's, it's not pure water. So this man decided to do it. And he did it. And then he didn't have any conscience anymore. He didn't care to do bad things against Torah, against humanity. He went so low. But then one day he thought, after a short time, he said to himself, I can't believe it. If the water that is not pure can bring me so down, can actually take away my conscience that I'm, that I'm not sensitive anymore, that I don't feel guilty, that I don't feel bad when I do something wrong, that's terrible. That shows that Torah is so strong. And he became a Baal Tshuva. He went back and he became a great man. He left all his evil ways because he realized the strength of Torah. He realized, you know, you know how mitzvahs how everything is so true and that's what happened with Orpah she went really down and she left so low now we can concentrate on Ruth Ruth stayed and she said to her mother-in-law I'm not gonna leave I'm not gonna leave you I can't and here girls come I always have goosebumps when I read it some of the most emotional meaningful statements that we have in the Torah what did Ruth tell Naomi, and this is something I remember as a child when I was a teacher, we had a song, you know, about it. We used to sing and I would always cry, you know, what Naomi, what Ruth told Naomi. Uh, and from here we learn many laws as well. So let me tell you, what did she tell her? Ruth told her, please, please don't let me leave you. I'm not going to leave you. So Naomi said that she can't get rid of her. And before Naomi had a chance to tell her more, she did tell her, but what the, what the Megillah is telling us, what did she tell her? I'll, I'll look inside. Kel asher telchi elech. Ruth is telling her mother-in-law, wherever you will go, I will go. 
wherever you will sleep, I will sleep. Oh, I, I, I always get goosebumps. Amech ami, your nation is my nation. Ve'elokaich elokai, your God Naomi is going to be my God. And wherever you will die, I'll die as well. And wherever you will be buried, I'll be buried. And the only thing that will divide between us will be death. Ki hamavet yafrid benil venech. Okay. Very strong words, very powerful words, very meaningful words. Now, what is uh, the Torah telling us? What do we learn from it? We learn from it that Ruth, Naomi, was trying to talk Ruth out of it, out of going to Israel. Naomi did it for one reason. She wanted to make sure to know if she really means it. And for Naomi, in a way, that was an embarrassment. She left the Jewish people. She was an aristocrat woman, dressed well, very smart, very wealthy, always helping everybody. She had a nice husband, nice family. She's coming all on her own. And who she's bringing? A Moabite woman with her. Like, what are you doing? That would be like an embarrassment for her. And she, she felt bad. She loved Ruth. She thought, well, Ruth has no future in Israel. What does she have? She wanted her to stay and go get married and be happy and, and live life, nice life. Why did she have to come with her? So she tried telling her many things. And then what, what did she tell her? She said, you know, Ruth, if, you, if you're going to convert to Judaism, you have to know that we have such a law that we're not allowed to walk too much. There is a law of Tchum Shabbat that even, never mind on Shabbat, you're not allowed to drive, but you also cannot walk a certain distance, we won't go into de the details, outside of city limits. And that's why Ruth told her, wherever you will go, I will go. It's okay. If we're not allowed to go too much of city limits, I'll follow. Then Naomi tells her, you know what? If you're going to become Jewish, we have the mitzvah that as a woman, you cannot be with any alone with any strange man. And a man cannot be a strange woman. You cannot do yichud. You cannot be alone in a room in a house with a man if he's not your husband or your brother or your father, right? Somebody else. And it's difficult. You're not used to that stuff. I mean, you're used to it since, you know, you were married with my son. But so that's why she told her, wherever you will sleep, I will sleep. I'm not. If I cannot sleep in a home with a strange man, I know it's difficult. I'm not going to do it. Then Naomi tells her, you know what? We have 613 mitzvot, so many commandments. Why do you need it? So Naomi told her, Ruth told her, my nation is your nation. If your nation has 613 mitzvot, fine. I'm committing to do it. Then Ruth told, then Naomi tells Ruth, you know that in, if you're going to become Jewish, you cannot worship idols. You have only one God. We don't believe in any helpers and any things like that there's only one god and only to one god we pray so ruth told her my god i mean your god will be my god then she told her you know that in torah it was hardly um practiced but we do have corporal punishment if some people will deserve it we always the bedin always found reasons not to do it, even if somebody uh, deserved it, they always found reasons not to. And if they said, if the if somebody deserves death or something, God forbid, Hashem will take care to do it themselves. But you do have that concept in Torah. So she said, that's okay. Whatever you will die, I'll die. That's what she answered, right? And then she told her that there are, if some people, God forbid, are killed by corporal punishment by the bad dean, so they buried in this place, another place, she said, wherever you'll be buried, I'll be buried. I just brought you a little bit, the inside story that shows that it wasn't just that she told her those beautiful words, it, she answered it. But again, I would like to finish the story of Ruth, and I will continue more, that what she told her, very profound words. 
Wherever you will go, I'll go. Wherever you will sleep, I'll sleep. Your God is my God. Your nation is my nation. Wherever you'll die, I'll die. Wherever you'll be buried, I'll be buried. She was so committed. She really wanted to become a Yid. And now, as they were coming, we'll finish with that just because we wanted to speak a little bit about Shavuot. One thing we want to learn that is very, very special. Ruth, when you take her name, the three words come to number 606. The word Ruth. Reish, Ruth, right? Reish is 200. Vav is six. And Taf is 400. So 206 and 400 is 606. Now, Ruth, when she wasn't Jewish, she still didn't convert here, but I'm saying, but before, when she wasn't Jewish, before she converted, she had to uh, keep only seven, seven Noahid laws, right? Sheva mitzvot nei Noah. Nine Jewish people have only seven laws. We won't, we won't review them now, but we know there's only seven laws. Now, Ruth, when she became Jewish, she had the seven mitzvot and her name, is the gematria is the acronym of 606 the numerical value not acronym the numerical value of 606 so in her name and the mitzvot that she had she possessed all the 613 mitzvot which we got in the torah girls next week we're going to speak now a little bit about shavuot because Hal shavuot is coming and we have so many special things to share god willing next week we'll continue we're probably going to need another one uh two classes or so to continue to see her greatness and what happened when she came and how did she become the grandma of david amelech what happened who married her and so on and so forth is a an amazing story and, and, and what she allowed and, and how everything went with Naomi. This Shabbos is a very special Shabbos. It's called Shabbat Achdut. Shabbos that is a unity Shabbos because when the Eden came to um, Har Sinai, when they camped in the mountain before they got the Torah, it says, Vayichan Sham Yisrael, Vayichan. Vayichan is, is a singular word. Usually it should say Vayachanu and it says, always the 40 days in the desert whenever the jewish people travel whenever they camp it was always with uh unfortunately with a fight with a argument with a quarrel and this was the first time it says Vayichan sham Yisrael ke'ish echad belev echad like one person with one heart they were all united and that's how they deserved to get the torah it was so so special and the shabbos before the shabbos before shavuot we speak about it, we think about it, how amazing we have to be, that we have to be united, not to look at each other's differences, to try to swallow. It's so hard. It's so hard to be united. It's so easy to say, oh, to see the differences, to see the fault in other people. It's so easy to speak behind the back. This is just the way we are, the way we were created. And we have to work on ourselves to be positive, to be united, and to see the goodness in each one. And as we know, when Hashem wanted to give the Torah, what did Hashem ask the Jews? Do you want to get the Torah? We know Hashem asked all the nations. And what did the Jewish people answer? The two special words, na'ase venishma, na'ase venishma. We will do and then we'll hear. What does it mean? Don't you have to listen first and then you know what to do? What does it mean? Because the Jewish people told Hashem, we trust you. If you want to give us the Torah, we're not asking you what does this say in the Torah. First we will do, then we will, we will listen, which means we will ask why. First we know I have to brush my teeth, and then I'll learn that and why, why do I have to floss and what happens if I don't, but first I have to brush my teeth because I trust whoever told me to brush teeth that is good. When we, when it comes to Torah, we cannot say, first I'll learn everything to understand. And then when I'm going to be an old woman, I'm going to be an old man and I'm going to be wise, I'm going to start keeping Torah mitzvot. It's the same thing as a child will say, well, I don't want to eat healthy and I don't want to exercise and I don't want to brush my teeth and I don't want to shower and I don't want to cut my nails and I don't want to do nothing because it's annoying. Why do I have to do it when I'm going to be an adult and I'll understand how this helps and how this helps and how this helps, then I'll start doing it. That's going to be very foolish. We understand it's foolish, 
is the same thing, if not more so, on Torah. Who gave us the Torah? I didn't write it. You didn't write it. Moshe didn't write it. It's godly. And, and, and Baruch Hashem, all of us that are coming to the class, every time we prove more and more, we try to understand more how we see that the Torah couldn't be written by a human. Moshe Rabbeinu lived these 120 years in a very small place in Midian, in like Egypt. He didn't go to Israel, in Jordan, in that place, he lived 120 years. He was a very wise man, but how was he able to write the Torah? How was he able to write in the book of Leviticus that you cannot eat this animal and this animal, the names of those animals? He never seen these animals in his life. Some of those animals were discovered in Australia, in Africa, in, in, in countries that he was never there. They, he didn't see those animals. They did not live in the Sinai Desert. Obviously, the Torah was godly. Obviously, Hashem wrote it. And many, many more, more, more things. And as we, those of you who join, will learn more and we'll understand the truth of Torah. So that's what we we'll learn from Shavuot. This holiday is so special. And it's really sad that many people don't know about Shavuot because this is the, the holiday that made us as people, right? That's how we got the Torah. And that's why Shavuot is so important, girls and ladies, that we do go on Sunday. And I hope everybody will be able to go to shul even for a very short time, at least to listen to the Ten Commandments. Because the Ten Commandments were given on Shavuot, on the 6th of Sivan. And it's so important when we go to shul and Baruch Hashem that I know we still are careful with COVID, but we're allowed to go to shul and I hope nobody is afraid anymore to go out. You can still come with a mask if you wish to. You can still stand social distance stand far. The rabbi reads the Torah very loud. The part of the Ten Commandments is not long. The reason we do ice cream parties and this because we want the children to come because the rabbi said that when Hashem gave the Torah, all of us were there. I don't remember, I don't know if you remember, but all the souls that were ever would be born, it says everybody was present in Mount Sinai. And we all heard it. That's why even babies that we think they don't understand and they don't, but their soul understand. Their neshama understand. The Rebbe said it's important to bring everybody at least just to listen to the Ten Commandments. And I always try to think when I'm standing there before we start in the Ten Commandments. And if somebody cannot for some reason to go, please read it at home. If you cannot get to a shul to listen and you think, you know, you close your eyes and you meditate and you think, wow, imagine you're standing with millions of people around the mountain. You're standing very far. There is a tall mountain. There is fire. There is thunder. There is, you know, it wasn't rain, but lightning. And, and it was, it was an, an awesome experience. Millions of people are standing. That's the only religion, the only people that God revealed himself to all of us it's not like in one religion god spoke to muhammad god spoke to this this one had a dream that one had a dream none of us had a dream millions of people had said it over and over and over and everybody believes in it that hashem all the religions know that god gave the torah on mount sinai god came down on mount sinai and gave us the torah we all heard the Ten Commandments, and you stand there in shul, or if, or if there is no way that you can come to shul, I mean, obviously much better in shul, but there is no way you can come to shul, please read it at home, and you think, yes, I am reliving it all over again. Hashem did not give the Torah only 3,334 or 35 years ago. He is going to give the Torah again this Sunday, and I'm going to receive it, and you're going to receive it, we're all going to receive it. It's given every year with new power with new strength with new amazing um koa how should i say uh powers and ability for us to be able to receive it and to and and to keep it and to cherish it and to follow it and you know the hasidic wish for shvus we always wish each other not just good yontem, not just haksamea. i'll say it in hebrew and i'll translate Kabbalat HaTorah, le Kabel means to receive, to get. Kabbalat HaTorah, we should merit, to receive the Torah, to get, to get the Torah, besimcha u beprimiyut, with happiness and internally. Really to receive the Torah inside. Now you say, okay, I got the Torah. 
to mean it, to understand it, to think. I know we did not finish the book of Ruth, but when we stand there in Shul and we think, wow, Shavuot, my ancestor, Ruth, who was also a woman, what didn't she give up? She lived in such poverty, slept on the floor with her mother-in-law in Israel. They didn't even have shoes. It says that they went baderich on the way. And the Torah explains, the commentary explains that they didn't even, they were so poor that they didn't even have shoes. And she came from a lavish home. She was a princess. She was used to that everybody did everything for her. And now she hardly had clothes to wear and didn't have enough money even to buy shoes. How poor, how they lost everything. And she still wanted to be a Jew. She still wanted that holiness, that godliness. And this Sunday, Hashem is going to give us the Torah. So again, we should have Kabbalah Torah. We should receive the Torah in happiness. We are so proud that we are Jewish people. We are so proud that we have the Torah. We're so proud that we can do. And we should really get it internally. We should mean it. I should do mitzvah or not because somebody told me, the rabbi told me, Rochel told me, my friend told me. No, I want to do it whether somebody knows or somebody doesn't know. I'm saying brocha on the fruit when I remember on the food. My family doesn't believe in it, fine. But I'm going to say the bracha quietly if I feel uncomfortable from them because I want to do more mitzvot. I want to start keeping more from this Shavuot and on because it's so important. And, and in Chesidus, it explains the same thing as like on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, when we blow shofar, right? It makes the Satan, the Satan get confused and not say bad things about us. The same thing on Shavuot. When we get together, we want to receive the Torah. We get so many blessings. Hashem is protecting us and taking away all the terrible things that the Satan is always trying to speak on the Jewish people and trying to talk God into, God forbid, God forbid bad things to befall on the Jewish people, but we're going to pray on Shavuot that it's not going to happen. We're going to tell Hashem we're so happy that you're giving us the Torah again for the 3,000 again and again because we live now in this era. We live now in this nation, in this time, in Canada, in Israel, there and there, wherever we are, we're going to receive the Torah with happiness and we're going to keep it and we're going to be so proud of ourselves. And girls, one more thing I want to mention before we're going to open for questions and answers. If somebody wants, it's still a little bit early, so that's great. If you remember when Hashem wanted to give the Torah to the Jewish people, he told Moshe, and this is something that is very special about us women. Yes, as we discuss many times that we have the feminine part of Hashem. God is neither man or women. He is not neither male, male or, or female. He it's nature, it's everything. The power of Hashem has both uh, powers in him, in it, in her. Hashem has the feminine part and the masculine part. Most of the time we do speak to Hashem in masculine, melech, king. But when we say the shechina, the, the, the divine spirit, the, the, the divine um, holiness, shechina is feminine, Shabbat is feminine right? In Hebrew, Torah is feminine. So Hashem is both in it. Otherwise, Hashem didn't have to create men and women. To have, people tell me, well, to have children. So Hashem could have created uh, a human being and animals that don't need a man and a woman. But Hashem wanted both because we both give something to the world that the femininity has something that the masculinity doesn't have. And we learn from each other. So when Hashem wanted to give the Torah, Hashem put that power in it. And Hashem told Moshe, Ko tomar, it's in Yitro, we're going to be learning, reading it. Ko tomar lebet Yaakov v'taged libnei Israel. Ko tomar, that's how you should say it, Amira. To say lebet Yaakov, bet Yaakov means the house of Jacob. Actually, we have a shul here like that. That's wonderful. But bet Yaakov means to the women. And schools of girls, if you know, in Europe and in New York and all over the world, there are many schools of girls that are called Bes Yaakov, because that means the women. So Hashem told Moshe, speak to the women, soft words, lomar is in gentle way, v'taged libne Israel, and you should speak harsh words, libne Israel, to the children, to the sons of Israel, which means the men. What does it mean? Hashem said to Moshe, when you will give the Torah that I'm giving you, you're going to teach the people, first of all, speak to the women first. 
But when you speak to the women, you don't have to speak to them in a harsh way. If you are not going to do this, you're going to get this. Speak to them in a nice way, in a pleasant way, in a feminine way. That's how women understand. And if you will explain to them well enough and they're going to want to receive the Torah, they're going to make sure that the men will do it as well. We know how to find ways to influence the men in our family, in our families to follow the right way, in gentle way, in nice ways, and so on. But when you speak to the men, you have to tell them all more in a harsh way because that's the way men are. That's one of the reasons that men have to wear a kippah. Why women don't have to wear a kippah? Kippah is something that you have to remember that Hashem is above you. And this is one of the reasons that men wear a kippah. I'm not speaking about women covering their after they get married. This is a different reason. Women don't have to wear a kippah. Don't we have to remember Hashem is above us? We also have to remember. But for us, it's easier the way our bodies are with our getting our period once a month. I mean, I know later on it's Absalom, but still we are very in tune with creation, how Hashem is with our body. We create people with our bodies. We are very closer. We're closer to to holiness, to godliness. And we don't need that reminder. Men need more. It's not their fault. That's the way Hashem created them. So they need the tefillin every day and they need more mitzvot to do all the time to keep themselves from the ego and from, from many of the, from the selfishness and so on. Not to say that the feminine part of the world doesn't have it. You know, you have men that are very, very feminine. You have women that are very masculine as well, right? But we're speaking about the general weight. And this is something that I wanted to mention I'm not trying to say that we are better or men are better. We're the same. We have different missions. And now with giving of the Torah, we're learning that Hashem told Moshe, speak to the women first, speak to them nice because they can influence the men. So girls, now we do have a special privilege, a special task. And we are getting the Torah again on Shavuot. Each one of us knows very well what we can bring at home. What can we make at home better? I want my husband to be better this way, my partner, my father, my uncle, my son, whoever it is, my daughter, but not just the men, the, the, the children, whoever we have influence on, my girlfriend, my, my acquaintance, whatever it is, Hashem told Moshe that we have, we are the Bet Yaakov, we are the women, and we have special powers, let me use it, but I've got to do it with Bina, I've got to do it with smartness, remember we learned, I remember it was something about day and night, how night is very important too. And during the night, you don't see. What do we learn from it as women, as men, as everybody? That many times we have to not say. We have to close our mouth, we have to close our eyes. We have to show that we didn't see. Or we don't have to comment. Many times when your child or somebody that you know did something wrong, you don't have to say anything. If they know you saw or you noticed, you don't have to look and embarrass them and you move your, your face away or you walk into the room later, they know that you realized. And many times it's much more powerful if you don't say anything than you say. So we have to know what to say, when to say, when not to say. And many times that lesson is more strong when you didn't say anything. So we're going to use all our strength that Hashem is giving us, the privilege that Hashem gave us as we were born, women, girls, we're going to use it to the right way. We're going to get the Torah besimcha u'bepnimiyut. We're going to receive the Torah, God willing, on Sunday with happiness internally. We're going to internalize the mitzvot. We're going to make it part of us because that's what Hashem did when Hashem came down on Har Sinai. It says, before Hashem gave the Torah, we know Sarah, Rivka, Rachel, and Leah, Avraham, Yitzchak, Yaakov, they kept all the Torah. They kept all the mitzvot. Sarah did chala, right? She lit Shabbos candles. Then Rivka did after that in the tent when it stopped. They ate matzahs. The Yaakov put on tefillin. They did all the things. So why did we need the Torah? What did it say on Torah? Vayared Hashem. Hashem yarad. Hashem came down. Al Har Sinai. Hashem came down. What does it mean? And I'll Explain it in short. I think some of you perhaps heard that analogy before, that explanation. Before Hashem gave the Torah, the world and godliness were two different things. Godliness did not come to the world, which means that if you had, here I have a paper that Megillat wrote in Hebrew, Megillat wrote is printed. I printed it, it's easier than to have a whole book. 
I cannot throw away this paper. Why? Because this paper became holy. Because Hashem came down to this world and this paper became holy because Torah words are written on it. Before Hashem gave the Torah, nothing could have become holy. You know how Yaakov put on tefillin? He did not put on tefillin the way we do now. The tefillin, he had a stick and he did those black lines on the sheep that he was taking care. He did it. Everything was only in your head. Nothing in this world became holy. The only mitzvah that was holy, that was special, is the mitzvah of Brit Milah, the mitzvah of make a circumcision because Hashem had actually commanded Avram to do it. But otherwise, they did it on their own choice. And the world was one thing and there was no holiness. It's hard for us to understand it. When Hashem gave the Torah, it says, by Yared Hashem, Hashem came down. Things became holy. You don't throw away a kippah. You don't throw away a holy paper that has holy. You don't throw away, God forbid, a Torah, God forbid. You don't throw away because something material, something physical now becomes holy. When you take food and you make it kosher by kosher food and you cook it, you eat it on Shabbat and you say a blessing, you bring it, you elevate it, you make it special and make it holy. Let us all uh, hope that we're going to be able to use our powers as Jewish women, get the Torah in a special way with happiness and continue and give it to everybody around us. I would love to open the, store, the floor as we say to some comments or questions. We have a few minutes. If somebody- I have a question. Sure. Uh, um, in Israel and in mm -hmm. India, we had this uh, Gniza. Right. Where is it in Calgary? Gniza, that you, you would, you would uh, um, no, hide things in there? Yeah. Store? No, anything that is uh, like a prayer book or a page that is uh, for prayers or uh, right. that is torn apart or something. And you can't that use it. Where yeah. you can't use it. So we used to put it in the Gniza. In India, we had a Gniza. In Israel, we had it at the right. cemetery. It's a Hebrew word. But word here, I don't had. know where it is. We, we bring it to the cemetery. There's a place in the Beis Achaim in the cemetery that we bury it. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, we do if have I have it. something, what do I do? You can bring it. Either you bring it to the cemetery or you bring it to Chabad House. You let us know and we'll take it there. Okay, thank was, you so much. My pleasure. What Jeanette is saying is because if something, if a prayer book is torn or a book, we're not allowed to throw it away. Correct. And we can't use it. So, yeah. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Thank, thank you. Thank I didn't you. read who thank said. You. Very, yeah, I, very much. Uh, there's so much, you know, so much, and you share so many important things. Thank you so much. Beautiful, my, beautiful learning. Thank my you. pleasure, Mrs. Sheffield. I hope you'll be able to join us again next week. We meet every week on Thursday at eight o'clock and we're going to continue. I'm sure everybody wants to know the story of Ruth. And I love always every year to learn it again and again and read it because it just makes me learn a lot from that special woman and see how much somebody was able to accomplish coming from such a terrible place and where she, how she rose gives us all a lot of hope. I did not see what the, the person wrote who is the Dr. D. Pollock. I'm not sure what that is. So if you wouldn't mind to write it again, or you can tell the later who you are. Somebody else wants to read it. Hello, Rebbe Tzimatis. Rebbe that's me. Debbie Pollock. Is Rebbe Winnipeg. Debbie, that's right. As I said, you know, we didn't see you in ages. Yeah, we, we have not seen you in ages. Welcome back. So late, Thank you so much. My thank message you. to you was, I said, thank you for the class. And I said, happy Shavuot. And it was good. It's good to see you again. Thank you. And you too. Thanks and for coming by. Us again. Yeah, that's wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you. It's always the same. I want to say we don't always send an email. I try or WhatsApp, but it's always the same Zoom. Okay, Mrs. Shaftel. I know they join us today. It's always the same Zoom for Family Conversation. Rosie, you wanted to say something as well? As we yes. Yes. Hi, Rachel. I'm back, hello, as you hello. know. Yeah, so nice. Um, all I want to know is what time is the reading of the Ten Commandments on that's Sunday? Correct. That's correct. It's about 1115. 
And we're going to make it as exact as possible to 11.15 because that's what we had advertised. And okay. Baruch Hashem, we have many, many people that said that they'll are that RSVP that they'll come so and, and children so we don't want to make it long so you know that's going to be the Torah ring and take out the Torah it's very nice you know and you read the Ten Commandments and like I said we meditate we stand there we imagine Harsina there so whoever can bring your children yourself whoever can make it is going to be very very special and as I said if you cannot for no way to come so please read it at home study it at home and and we'll do whatever we can. I know that on Shavuot, we have a custom to eat dairy. We didn't have time to go. Right. Into. This is not a mitzvah. We don't must to. What we must do is get the Torah, listen to the Ten Commandments. That's special mitzvah. And obviously light candles. Forgot to mention, tomorrow we're lighting candles. But then yeah. Sunday night exactly. and Monday night, we're lighting candles. Saturday night, I mean, please, Saturday night, you have to wait till Shabbos is out. It's probably 11 o'clock. It's very late. And we eat a yont of meals. So yeah, Saturday but we have to use kind of... ruffle. We have to use my, my class in LA, my Torah class I do. She said that. Um, Three existing flame. Yes. yes. We're not allowed to start a new flame. So we leave the, you know, the stove on, you know, if you right. have a gas stove. Flame or to flame. On the shamalich. And on Monday girls, unfortunately, those of us who have to say Yisker. Yisker. Monday is Yisker. Yeah. So Sunday is getting the Torah. And Monday was the Easter. Monday is Easter. You can tell your friends as well. Yeah, unfortunately. Okay. I'm in that league as well after Easter from my mother, but it's very special. Always when there is Yonta, we say Easter because we always have yep. to remember our loved ones. Whenever yep. we're happy, we are, our happiness is never complete because we have to, because we lost loved ones and we have to remember them and bring them into our life. Absolutely. God willing, a man, Moshiach should come soon. So they should be able to come down with the resurrection of the dead and we wouldn't have to say he's scared. Oh, yeah, man, it should happen Amen. soon. Amen. 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 Marley, uh, Marley Shachar, I hope you enjoyed yourself. It was so nice seeing you here. And hopefully yeah, you can join you. us again. Yeah. I'll, learn I'll, try, I'll try to join you next week and the one after. You're doing on Thursdays, right? This time. Right on Thursday at 8 o'clock, right. Yeah, we'll learn more about Ruth. Now it's getting very interesting as she was there in the field and how... She meets the man that later on, you know, she had the child with who was was very from the from Naomi and how she went there and, and the whole thing. It's very, very nice, you know, that she was so special and he noticed her and so on and so forth. Yeah. Very interesting. A lot of things we learned from it. Beautiful. Thank yeah. you. Oh, thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank, thank you. you. Um, thank so, you all. Have a good Shabbos. How do we Wonderful. stay? A lot of unity, and hopefully we'll see some of you on Sunday. I hope those of you can make it, and um, and otherwise, all of us should have a wonderful yontav. And again, I want to give all of us a wish: Kabbalat Torah besimcha uBeplimiyut. We should receive the Torah, Amen, with happiness, internalize it, be happy who we are. We are so lucky that we're Jewish. We're so lucky we're Jewish women. We're so lucky we have the Torah. We're so lucky all the special. Um, challenges that we have and the special privileges that we have, we should be able to keep it. How do we say it again? Kabbalah HaTorah. 